Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. For those new to this format, this is a now monthly bonus podcast where we take a break from interviewing chess luminaries and have a conversation about a famous chess book. Uh, So far, I've had guest hosts help me out and discuss the life and games of Mikhail Tal. Sam Copeland and I talked about that a few months back. Reassess Your Chess with Todd Kennedy, and Bobby Fischer Goes to War with Chris Wainscott. All of those are available in the archive for free, as always. And this week, we're going to be discussing another true classic, although perhaps slightly less universally universally beloved than the other books, as we'll discuss. It is the book Think Like a Grandmaster, 1971, by Grandmaster Alexander Kotov. And here to discuss it with me, we have um, someone who really, short of getting Alexander Kotov, may he rest in peace himself. There's very few people who I would be more excited to dissect this book with. Um, He's someone who should be familiar to a lot of you. He's been on the show as a guest in October of 2018. Um, He is a cognitive scientist, a USCF master. Um, He is also the co-author of the popular book, and psychology study, The Invisible Gorilla, so a bit of an expert on thinking and chess. So who better to bring in at this moment than Christopher Chabri? Welcome back, Chris. How have you been? I've been great. Thanks for having me do this with you. This is this is sort of the best podcast I could ever imagine being on. Wow, that's so nice of you to say, and it's, and thank you. I, I'm I'm really I'm really touched that you offered to do this. Um, I know that you're a busy guy, uh, dad, with a lot of professional responsibilities as well. And if our outline and our back and forth from email is any in, in the, any indication, um, you have not been slacking on the preparation. <laughs> no, I probably did too much preparation, but I was, as I guess we'll discuss, I was really excited to be able to read this book. Uh, carefully and in detail and think about it um, since I hadn't really thought about it in a long time. So it was a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those books that I feel we've had so many guests recommended on the show. Uh, Raphael Latau, uh, GMRB Ramesh, uh, Adult Improver, Stepian Tomic. Um, But it's one of those that I think a lot of people might sort of reflexively recommend because they read it at a formative time and they just grabbed them. and, And we'll get into that more later. But um, first, Krista, if you could just give a little more for people who have not heard our other interview yet or aren't so familiar with you um, about, first of all, your background, but also your background with this book. Sure. So uh, I learned how to play when I was five years old, if we want to go all the way back, which was during the fisher Spassky match, my father taught me. And I didn't start playing in tournaments until about five years later. But um, at that point, I eventually made um, USCF master, and my my highest USCF rating was in the twenty three hundreds. Um, I got really into organizing uh, in the nineteen eighties, and also editing chess magazines. Um, started a, a short lived um, thing called American Chess Journal in the nineties. Published a few books myself, um, and uh, then I never quit chess. I quit playing tournament chess uh, for about 15 years and then sort of got back into it um, a lot more when my son started playing about uh, seven years ago or so. And um, actually trying now to play more actual tournaments and really improve and hopefully reach a new um, high in ability or in, in, in rating at least. And kind of as part of that process, I've been going back and reading a lot of books, some that I'd read before, some that I never got around to reading, some new ones. And it's kind of funny, I came across, um, you know, many people mention this book, many people mention Kotov, and they mention, think like a grandmaster, and in particular, they mention, you know, one particular thing from it, which is the first, you know, big concept in the book. Um, And I realized that although I had sort of skimmed the book in the past, I'd never really read it all the way through. And then when you started this podcast, you know, what better, what better excuse to, to go through it and to, uh, to reflect on it, um, and think about it than this. Yeah. So to be clear, when I started the the recap podcast, not the uh, the perpetual chess more generally. Um, 
So yeah, and for my background with the book, um, it's one of those books that I read as a teenager. Um, and again, I think part of the reason that this book landed with so many top players is published in 1971. So anyone around my age, um, I'm, I just turned 43. Um, there weren't that many great books. Uh, if you if you were reading the bulk of your chess books as a teen, um, this was one that was definitely going to get recommended. Um, and it's um, it's unique. Uh, I mean, I think it was especially unique for 1971 when it was published. Um, but even even now, I mean, it has a sort of unique approach, and and for that reason, a special place um, in history. Um, so which, uh, version, I mean, of course this book has had many editions. Um, I read somewhere that it's one of the most popular, mo- best-selling chess books of all time. Although it doesn't, you know, it doesn't pop up on the Amazon list. I think it's not as popular, not as well-selling as it used to be. Um, but Chris, which version of the book, uh, did you use for our discussion and for your rereading it? Well, I have owned this book for decades, but as I said, I never read it cover to cover until, uh, you know, last month in preparing for this. So my copy was a paperback chess digest edition from 1971. I guess chess digest published the American edition at the same time that Batsford published the UK edition, which was the first English translation. And my copy was in descriptive notation and I didn't get it in 1971. I probably got it sometime in the eighties. Um, it was, I think at the time it was sort of underground literature like secret knowledge or something like that you know you go to the bookstore and it's all reinfeld and horowitz and chernev and and they obviously wrote a lot of great books but they were nothing compared to uh kotov and think like a grandmaster and and so on so um it was i think um kind of a rarity you know even 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 back then or it was sort of like a status symbol almost like this is the book that has like the real knowledge in it that uh you know you don't need once you've gotten past um, the popular book. So I, but I didn't like to read descriptive notation. Now it's sort of too hard to visualize for me. So I went and got a copy of the Batsford algebraic edition from the 1990s, which they have added a few notes by John Nunn and Graham Burgess, I think. Um, but this was before the days of engine checking, um, which didn't really start until I think, you know, the two thousands uh, and later. Okay. Yeah. And I, Similar, I mean, similar story, except I did read it as a kid, but I have no idea what happened to my original copy, um, which is, you know, I've moved a lot since then. It's not super surprising. And a lot of my older books were were falling apart by some point. So for the purpose of uh, of rereading it, I, I, of course, as I've talked about in prior recaptures, I gravitate towards the digital versions. So I went with the Kindle, which was published in uh, 2012. Um, so it does have, I mean, it doesn't seem based on, I actually don't know the degree to which it's engine check, but it sounds similar in terms of how they approach it to what you say. I mean, uh, legendary GM John Nunn definitely chimes in with a few comments where something that Kotov suggests is, has proven to be wrong, but it's uh, done with a light hand. I mean, there's not a ton of overriding. So I suspect they mostly just tried to let the book stand in, in its original form. Yeah, I think so. And I think that for this kind of book, that makes more sense than, like, let's say, an old opening book or um, even a, a book of which is just analyzed games or annotated games where the whole point is is the quality of the annotations or something like that. That makes sense. Although I, I do think maybe we'll get to this later on. I do think they could they could improve. There could be some improvements in, in a modern edition of this book. Yeah, for sure. There could. Although, again, like I don't feel like it's selling like hotcakes these days. Although, I mean, I guess if they got someone like John Nunn or someone, um, you know, another well-respected chess author to sort of uh, interject, like obviously someone like a Jakob Argaard or someone who I'm sure will come up later, to interject with their own reflections based on how modern chess is approached. I think that could do well. But um, if they just narrow, like mildly um, touched it up, I'm not sure um, what it would do. So chess zeitgeist, um, uh, at the time of the original publication, of course, as you mentioned, Chris, this was, I mean, you're yourself basically a chess child of the uh, Fisher Spassky match. So this came right before it. So um, I've got a few notes here, too. But what would you say about the what should we know about the chess world in 1971? Well, of course, Fisher was about to play Spassky and had come back you know, to play after one of his absences and, uh, you know, managed to get into the inner zonal and, and crush everyone in the candidates matches and, uh, and so on, but he hadn't won the world championship yet. So I think this was maybe the point in time when 
the so-called Soviet school of chess was at its apex. And uh, one of the strong impressions I got from reading Kotov's book is how much it represents Sovietism or the Soviet style or the Soviet approach. And it, it, he explicitly sets out to say that, that that's what he's going to do. Uh, and obviously, with good reason, Soviet players were, you know, the greatest players in the world for the previous uh, 20 you know, 25 years or so, um, dominated, you know, all the inner zonals, candidates and so on, uh, with a couple of exceptions. So, uh, there was the right time to publish this book, I think, to sort of let people in on the secrets of the Soviet school and, and how to think like a grandmaster. It probably was a great marketing idea for whoever, whoever put it out, at least in English at the time, maybe it was a bestseller among a certain segment because of that. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really hard for, for any younger listeners, hard to overstate sort of the the um the awe that people held for sort of the the fabled soviet chess school and just everyone wanted to know like what is it that they're doing i mean my chess coming of age was in the early 90s and that was still how people thought despite the rise of fisher um the top 10 players in 1971 the aforementioned bobby fisher who as chris said was making his way through the candidates running roughshod through the candidate cycle uh in in preparation for what would eventually be a match with then world champion and world number two boris spassky number three uh victor korchenoy number four bent larson number five tigran petrosian number six laios portish number seven mikhail botfinik number eight, F.M. Geller, number nine, Lev Pologayevsky, and number 10, Mikhail Tal. So seven out of the 10 players were from the Soviet Union. And if anything, that's probably at the lower end of the spectrum, I would guess, over like the prior decade, if you took the top 10 players of each year. Um, I didn't fact check this, but I'm guessing that that was because of Fisher's ascendance. That was um, slightly lower level dominance than before, but it was still just everyone wondering what what's in the water in the Soviet Union and what's their secret. And this was one of, I mean, this was a book that really sort of set forth um, a way of thinking that was popular um, or that was commonplace um, amongst the top players in the Soviet Union. Yeah, and, and a lot of the contents is, is very Soviet-centric, as, as I noticed when I went through it again. Um, I couldn't help but notice that even though it's already 1971 when the book is published, maybe it was completed a few years earlier, but there's not a single Fisher game in, in the whole book, I think. Yeah, um, that's and, a good and, point. Yeah, and, which is interesting and from the, from the point of view of what we know in retrospect, which is that Fisher's approach to chess and his great games and so on are very admired nowadays. And so many players even today will say that you have to study Fisher's games even though he hasn't really played at all in, in, in about 30 years, let alone seriously, which was more like 50 years. Um, but at the time uh, in this presentation, and maybe there were political reasons for it, I don't know, um, ideological reasons, he was sort of ignored in this book. Yeah, it's true. It's a good point. And and as you you highlighted in the notes, and I also couldn't help but notice, there's so many games from uh, Zurich 1953. Um, so it's not just that he was, um, that he was not using... Fisher's games, it just seems generally he was, um, I mean, of course, information was disseminated more slowly back then. But I mean, he was using a lot of games that even then we would consider um, not of the most recent vintage, but although certainly classic games in, in, men, in many cases. I'm sure that all the Soviet grandmasters knew Fisher's games pretty well, even if they even if they didn't know them quite as well as Botvinnik's and, uh, you know, and, and, and Smyslov's and and so on. It's a striking, it's a striking omission, but, but maybe, maybe the, um, well, of course there could be ideological reasons, but I think also he, he tries in the book to talk about what players have said about their thought processes during games. And obviously it would be more accessible to him to talk to other Soviet players, to think about his own thought processes and to read what has been written in the Russian language. So that may partially explain, you know, the, the omission of, of, of uh, Fisher as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And you mentioned ideolo ideology, excuse me, ideological reasons. It's a little late for me, sorry. Um, and that that calls to mind, of course, Kotov was known to be a sort of uh, Soviet apparatchik. Um, in fact, um, 
Uh, it's you know widely reported that he was at least uh, KGB friendly, if not actual KGB. Um, uh, Jenna Sasenko, a wonderful chess author who's been on Perpetual Chess and written some amazing books himself and, of course, came up in the, the Soviet Union before emigrating to the Netherlands, uh, said, uh, uh, and said in uh, the, the Rise and Fall of David Bronstein, he said, quote, Alexander Kotov, who wielded considerable weight as administrator in the Soviet chess world and whose ties to the KGB were no secret to anybody, was very conscientious about spreading a, uh, a rumor about the child's name, which was... Um, Refer- referring to the, um, referring to a rumor that one of Bronstein's children was named after Trotsky, which is neither here or there. But the point is that uh, Kotov was widely rumored to be KGB, so he also may have had sort of, um, he may not have wanted to give a spotlight to Fisher. Um, in addition to, as you said, having more proximity to the um, the other grandmasters. But but aside from being a potential. Uh, KGB member, uh, what other info do we should we give for Kotov's bio, Chris? Well, I, just, I can't I can't let what I can't let the story you said go by without just pointing out that this is the original meaning of the word political correctness. Um, that you know, if you named your son after Trotsky, you know that would that could come back to that that would be politically incorrect, and that could come back to hurt you. And this is where the whole concept of political correctness and political incorrectness came from, and it mattered a lot more, I guess, uh, you know, in that you know, in that society and that political system and so on at the time. Um, uh, I think Kotov is, you know, I don't know anything about his KGB um, uh, ties or non-ties. I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't read Sasanko's books and a lot of that, those histories of sort of Soviet chess. I haven't really gotten around to getting back to those. So I can't say anything about that. But um, as a player, um, well, we should say Kotov is probably best known now as an author. Um, there's one game of his, which is super famous, which I'll mention in a second, but he's really best known as an author. And, and it's, it's for this book. And then the follow-up book, which was called play like a grandmaster and the follow-up book to that, which is called train like a grandmaster. They're sort of a trilogy. Um, the, the latter two were published in, in, uh, like 1978 and 1981 and, and he died in 1981, I think. Um, so those books sort of published in the last decade of his life, I think have defined, um, his legacy most of all. Um, but he had really good results um, early on uh, in his career. He finished second in the USSR championship in 1939, um, which Bud Binnick won. Uh, he was the third Soviet grandmaster. I didn't know this, but Soviet Union, I did know, had their own um, grandmaster title system. Um, and he was the third person to get it after Botvinnik and Levenfish. Um, he won the Moscow championship. He was a Soviet co-champion with Bronstein. Um, he won a tournament ahead of Smyslov in Venice. Um, I wish they had more tournaments in places like Venice. It sounds fun. Yeah. Um, and, uh, the, um, I, I think the thing that I remember Kotov most for, uh, besides those three books, especially think like a grandmaster are, um, another book, which is called the Soviet school of chess. Um, and, a, a companion book, which is similar, but not the same called the Soviet chess school, which I think did a lot also besides this book to popularize the whole concept of, of the Soviet school of chess and the, the sort of mystique that attached to it for a long time. Um, that, and, um, his famous game from Zurich, 1953, um, where he obviously, I guess, had a good time considering that he won one of the most famous games of all time, um, against as black against Yuri Averbach who is presently the oldest living grandmaster at age 98. But yeah. in 1853, um, Kotov famously sacrificed his queen for a pawn to lure Averbach's king forward into a mating net that, that only closed many moves later. And I think it was a forced win after he sacrificed the queen, but but he said he did it without seeing all the way to the end, just um, you know, knowing that or believing that if he if he got White's king to advance deep into Black's position, he would figure out some way of, of mating or presumably at least get a perpetual and probably and probably mate. And it's a really striking combination. Anybody should look up Averbach Kotov Zurich 1953 if you're not familiar with it. Yeah, Chris, I'm glad you highlighted that game in your notes because that sent me down the rabbit hole looking at the game. And of course, I didn't remember it offhand uh, somewhat ashamedly. But as soon as I saw the position with Queen takes H3, I was thinking, oh, this game. And then, of course, I, I read a little bit about it. I um, watched one of King's Crusher's videos where he talked a little about it. I pulled up an engine and looked at it. So 
Um, here's what I gleaned. I mean, first of all, it's in the interesting color that you provide that, uh, that he admitted he didn't see a forced win because, um, he repeats moves just before the 40th move, uh, two times. And then, you know, it's one of these sequences where he can repeat and white has no choice. Uh, and then on the 40th move, he basically, he captures a pawn instead of repeating a third time. So he basically decided to go for it. He presumably, um, was buying time to make time control. And there was a forced win prior to time control but he didn't um and the, again this is um running the uh lee chess analysis board with a stockfish 10 engine not not a supercharged engine but probably good enough for these purposes um there there was a forced win prior to the 40th move but it actually was a draw at one moment but white went wrong um but it's interesting that you mentioned that he admitted that he didn't see the whole thing because being the author of think like a grandmaster and i know uh you know i i just had the the privilege of interviewing vishy anand and he's he mentioned in an interview that i came across in prepping for that the the idea that top players used to be able to just sort of like if they there was some nuance that they weren't missing they could kind of fake their way through it because um they they see more than anyone else anyway but now now that we have computers they don't necessarily see more than what you can check um so anyway it's nice that he admits that he didn't see the whole sequence but i mean it's a striking sacrifice and definitely a game worth checking out and of course we'll link to uh the a few resources in the show notes Funny thing, as far as I noticed in the book, he actually shows that position before Queen takes H three check, but doesn't give the rest of the game and think like a grandmaster. So he he seems kind of kind of modest about it in, in in his most famous book. Yeah, that's a good point, huh? And he was pretty much he was worse a lot of that game. I mean, he only he only leveled things and gave himself a fighting chance like a few moves before that sacrifice. Um, so yeah, interesting stuff. Um. And he talks somewhere in the book about being a bit of a late bloomer in chess too. So maybe that sort of framed his his desire to write so much about um about how to approach chess. Um, yeah, he um he he developed a lot in his twenties, and I think in, in by nineteen fifty three, I think he was around forty already playing in the candidates tournament. Of course, that was more normal back then than it is nowadays when you look at who's in the candidates tournament. But um, I think even even for the time, he was maybe a little bit of a late bloomer. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then uh, there's the question, which I think listeners might have gotten a feel for already, but for what level chess player would you say this is a book um, uh, that is appropriate in terms of chess improvement, Chris? Well, I would say um, I, I would say 1800 plus, 1900 plus is, is reasonable, um, but with a couple of caveats one, it's it's not, you know, one of the first 10 or 20 or 30 books I would suggest to anyone on how to improve. So it's it's more of a, a little bit of a connoisseur's book. And I think it would be fine for lower rated players as well if they approached it from the point of view that it's an interesting book and it's it's part of the history of chess literature and part of the history of chess thought and a, a major sort of milestone or maybe turning point in um, in, in how people think about um practical chess and chess improvement and so on. So anybody who sort of approaches it from that point of view and, and tries to pay attention to how it's written and, you know, think about what he doesn't say as well as what he says. I think anyone who's sort of interested in chess books will get something out of it from that point of view. If you really want to improve from it though, and, and work hard, um, yeah, you should probably be, you know, closer to, to 2000 maybe to get the most out of it. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, definitely not for the faint of heart. And I echo the sentiment. I mean, I've had you know, these, these first few recaptured episodes, I've noticed a lot of people, um, on Twitter and in the perpetual chess Facebook group saying like, you know, this, this inspired me to either reread the book or go out and buy it, which you guys are are welcome to do for this book. But I, I would, um, I, I would just echo what Chris said. It certainly has its place. There's some cool quotes. There's some good historical context, but, um, in terms of like my joy of reading out of the four books I've discussed so far i would probably put this forth um just just uh my personal opinion um i think in general books that are 50 years old or more you know they're they're classics but there have been so much learned about chess and how to improve at chess and how to study chess and learned about chess itself in the last 50 years that it's generally 
you know, not a great idea to base your chess improvement on things written 50 or more years ago. They're very interesting and, and useful, but that wouldn't be the core of like how you would try to get better. Yeah, you certainly wouldn't read like a nutrition book from 50 years ago as like the, you know. <laughs> or, or a book on how to play great soccer or anything like <laughs> yeah, because the game has changed. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, so we're going to get into the meat of the book, uh, beginning with talking about the structure and reading the first sentence. But first, we're going to take a quick break to hear about our friends at Chessable. So you guys are hearing Christopher Shibri and I talk about Think Like a Grandmaster, a classic book whose place in the chess canon is unquestioned, but which may not be the most practical book for club players looking to improve. For that purpose, might I recommend checking out Chess Strategy for Club Players by I am Herman Gruten on Chessable.com. Utilizing Chessable's Move Trainer technology and Chess Strategy for Club Players, you'll learn about pawn structure, piece placement, getting a lead in development, creating and exploiting open files, identifying weaknesses, taking advantage of a space advantage, king safety, and lots more. I am Gruten has been on the show. It's an incredible wealth of information. So go to chessable.com and check it out. Okay, so Chris is going to read the beginning of the book. And Chris, you you decided the uh, preface beginning with the preface would be more reflective. Yes. So there's a two page preface in this book before he gets to the introduction, which is where the real meat of the book starts. But I think the first paragraph of the preface is, is less weird and kind of maybe explains what's going to happen a little bit better than the first paragraph of the introduction. So um, he writes in 1971 or whenever he actually finished this manuscript, uh, quote, an immense number of books have been written on chess. Some chess writers annotate recent games. Others compile and bring up to date works on opening variations. But strange as it may seem, no one has had the idea of describing the methods by which the leading players of our time have reached the peak of their playing strength. Yet a study of these methods would greatly facilitate the process of mastering the intricacies of the game. Unquote. And I think that really is kind of describes what he thought was unique, I suppose, what he thought. And, and I think is pretty true. That's it's kind of unique in the chess literature at that point to really talk about the thinking process more than just about positional concepts, tactical ideas, strategy and so on. He thought th- talks more about what should be going on inside your your head while you're playing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, w- I would actually, I should have done more digging on like what were the most popular chess books at that point. I mean, certainly there are some classics, um, you know, My System, Chess Fundamentals, Lasker's Manual of Chess, um, some of the Richard Reddy books. I mean, there there were some classics that I can think of that existed at that point, but I don't know what was like the the commonly, what was commonly considered a classic at that time. But it certainly, I, I suspect that this was um this was a, a pretty big breakthrough in terms of uh, the way that that um, chess thought was dissected. I mean, which um, of course brings us to the major themes of the book. Um, and of course, this book is most famed for a few themes laid out in the first chapter. Yeah, um, you want me to sort of yeah with, with that yeah if you're if you're up for it yeah there are five chapters in this book um, but really the first one is the only one that anyone remembers I think and which is a little bit of a shame because I found there to be some interesting stuff in the rest of the book that I had no idea existed until I went back until I went back to it now but um, everybody talks about the first one the first chapter so I'll sort of describe that so um, it's called analysis of variations and it starts with a section called do you know how to analyze which you know usually i think the rule of thumb is if someone asks a question in a, in a title the answer is no um so the answer is you don't know how to analyze according to kotov but he's going to tell you how in the next subsection of, of chapter one called the tree of analysis so the tree of analysis is one of the two most famous concepts that comes out of this book and in a way, it's it's almost trivial to think about nowadays because anybody who knows anything about computer chess knows that computers analyze chess positions by constructing a tree, starting from the position on the board and then, you know, thinking about every possible legal move in that position. And then from each of the positions that results from all of those legal moves, all the possible legal moves from there. And you've got this gigantic tree with millions and millions and hundreds of millions and billions of possible positions. And that's what computers search through as fast as they can. Uh, Kotov was actually suggesting that uh, human beings, and in particular grandmasters, structure their thinking process by 
creating a tree in their minds. And he wasn't just saying the grandmasters do it. He was really prescribing it, advising it as the algorithm that players should follow if they want to play well. Um, and so the, the tree of analysis was, was the main, was the main idea of, of chapter one. And I guess it was kind of revolutionary at the time. The other main idea is candidate moves. And the idea there was that the way to construct the tree of analysis is just to start with the position on the board in front of you. And before you analyze any variations, before you start that mental dialogue of if I go here, he goes there, and then I play bishop takes e3, and then he plays f takes e3, but but I don't like that because such and such, before you start all that process, the calculation process, you should list in your mind or think about all the possible candidate moves that you want to analyze. Um, and then you should, of course, should do that for your opponent. Once you start analyzing the first of your candidate moves, then you should see, think in the resulting position, what are the moves my opponent might play? So it's a very prescriptive, orderly, systematic algorithm almost for uh, calculating variations that he claims will help you make better decisions at the board and that that's the way grandmasters um, are thinking. Um, and I guess, um, I guess if I were going to continue to go on about this, I would say he has a few, you know, a few important um, sub rules for this one is it's very important to enumerate the candidate moves first before you start analyzing them. Um, it's very important to evaluate one fully before going to the next one. So if you're thinking, should I play Bishop B5 or should I play uh, Knight F6? Well, first you come to a conclusion about what, what Bishop B5 will lead to before you start analyzing Knight F6. And then when you're done with both of them, then you compare and see which one which one is better. Um, and you don't recheck your analysis. So once you're done analyzing Bishop B5, never go back and analyze it anymore. Trust in what you concluded the first time you analyzed it. And that will, of course, fight time pressure. But I think he also thinks it will sort of force you to develop confidence in your and, and trust in your own calculations as well. And so it's a very, that's his prescription for, for how to think about what to play. And, and I guess nobody had really written out systematically how to analyze a position while you're playing a game. Yeah. And that's, uh, again, as you, as you mentioned, that's what it's most famous for. I mean, people talk about selecting candidate moves all the time. And certainly that is a concept that has stood the test of time. Um, other aspects of the book um as as you alluded to in in our notes chris um maybe um are not quite as um universally um acknowledged by by other grandmasters um and one one thing to note is just he's quite strident i mean i guess when when you write a book if you're gonna lay out a case i mean i guess you would know this better than me chris it doesn't do any good to to dilly dally and dither about uh what your thesis is but he's really he's really quite um quite dogmatic that this is the way it should be done. And I think that might be part of the reason why some people have pushed back. But uh, particularly, I mean, the idea of candidate moves is quite good. Uh, I mean, quite has stood the test of time. But the idea of um, never double checking your variations, I think, is a, <laughs> a little more controversial. And certainly, um, I, I have whether or not you should think that way, uh, it is not something I've managed to do. Um, and I think a lot of people might struggle with it. Um, but what are some of the other reactions um, that, you, that you came across in, uh, in prepping for, for this discussion, Chris? Well, as, as I said, the one reason why I was interested in this book was I had seen so many reactions to it already. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been written about a lot. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you, I'll give a flavor of a couple of them. Um, uh, Mark Dvoretsky, um, you know, has written several series of books, some in collaboration with Arthur Yusupov. Some of his books contain chapters written by other people. So he's actually said quite a bit about um, Kotov. And maybe in part because of his Soviet Russian background, he generally adopts a very respectful tone um, towards, uh, towards Kotov. So, for example, um, in Dvoretsky's book, Attack and Defense, which was um, the fifth volume of the first series of his books that came out from Batsford in the 1990s and really, you know, sort of brought Mark Dvoretsky to the attention of the rest of the world besides, besides Russia at the time, um, said Kotov was perhaps the first to highlight this divisive calculation. He recommended that you should immediately identify all the possible candidate moves, not just for your first move, but for subsequent ones, and not just for yourself, but for your opponent. But this principle by no means always works. 
Nevertheless, it is very good advice for many situations. So Dvoretsky sort of even himself, while saying it was, um, you know, a, a groundbreaking work and so on, says, well, it doesn't really work all the time. Um, but he points out, this is one of, one of the interesting things, I think he points out what you noted, Ben, which is that the candidate move idea is much more useful than the tree of analysis idea. And the candidate move idea is the one that has really survived and you find all over the place nowadays, even while people don't talk about the tree of analysis at all. And Dvoretsky gave three reasons why making sure you explicitly think about candidate moves before you start uh, just going into the, the analysis is useful. He said, first, it helps to survey the variations rationally. So I think by that, he means it does provide some structure to your analysis. So you don't just constantly jump back and forth or wonder whether you should be still thinking about the position or whatever. If you think, well, OK, here are three moves I'm going to look at and you do them one after the other, you have some kind of structure to your thoughts. Um, it helps to avoid spending a lot of time on one variation and then like looking at the clock and saying, oh no, I've got to make a move and never having even studied anything else, but just in a sense, you wasted your time. If you spent a lot of time analyzing one variation, one move, and didn't leave yourself enough time to analyze anything else, you might as well just played that move and yeah. saved yourself the time for the future, right? That's been uh, there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have that problem myself. I mean, I noticed when reading the book that some of the problems he identified in thinking Kotov identified, and I, I think legitimately are problems I have, like often I will feel like I'll invest a lot of time and, and even uh, time and um, I don't know what the right word is, but sort of like emotion in a particular candidate move. And I'll analyze it very concretely and I don't come to a conclusion, but I can't sort of move away from it because right, it's something yeah. I really know about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, dividing your time between different candidate moves explicitly, I think would help to fight against that. Um and then Dvoretsky's third point is one that, that other authors have really dwelled on even more, which is that this idea that you can only look at, you know, one move completely and then switch to another move and then switch to another move stops you from um, doing what Dvoretsky said was we sometimes discover resources, the, exist the existence of which we never suspected at the outset. So he means that when you're analyzing one move, you might discover an idea in analyzing that move that would also apply to one of the other candidate moves. Or uh, you might discover a new candidate move because you're analyzing one line and you say, oh, if only my pawn were already here, then my opponent wouldn't be able to, to play this reply. And so then it occurs to you, maybe I should move my pawn there first. And now you're back to the, 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 the root of the tree, adding a candidate move, which is totally against Kotov's algorithm. You know? So even, even Dvoretsky, who's respectful and descended, you know, and maybe is sort of like what became the modern avatar of the Soviet school in some ways, you know, even he has to sort of modify uh, Kotov's, um, Kotov's uh, dicta. Yeah. And just for any listeners, uh, I think mo a lot will be, but for any listeners not familiar with Dvoretsky, he's been, his books have been recommended almost every week on Perpetual Chess. He's probably the most respected trainer and chess author um, of all time. And uh, yeah, he um, ascended uh, after Kotov, but I'm sure there was uh, some overlap. So they probably had some personal interactions as well, which may have, um, you know, uh, as you say, the criticism is gentle, but um, valid in, in my mind. Um, okay. So, and you had a few other reactions from authors that you noticed as well, right, Chris? Yeah. I mean, I'll just, I'll just list a few out briefly because it's remarkable to me how many people spent time in their own books, just responding to Kotov's book. So, um, uh, you know, Willie Hendricks has this this book with a, the fantastic title, Move First, Think Later, um, <laughs> one of the best chess book titles of all time. Um, and uh, he actually responded to one of other one of Kotov's other statements. He doesn't he, he just sort of dismisses the tree of analysis out of hand, saying it's impractical. But um, Kotov has also made the statement in that same book that it's better to have a bad plan than to have no plan at all. And Hendricks. Um, you know, emphasizes that uh, that's not necessarily true, that a bad plan can be worse than no plan. And I don't know if Hendricks points this out, but I think with the rise of players like Magnus Carlsen, who often seem to be playing sort of without the traditional grand plans that you think of from people like Tarash and Capablanca and so on, but just, you know, playing to improve his position, as he once famously said, you know, my goal for this game is just to make 40 good moves. Um uh, Hendricks, I think, sort of alludes to those weaknesses in, in some of, um, you know, Kotov's um, dicta. Um, uh, 
In particular, Jonathan Tisdall, who wrote a fantastic book called Improve Your Chess Now, and John Nunn, who's wrote a very underappreciated book called Secrets of Practical Chess, both began with a whole chapter basically responding to, uh, to Kotov's Tree of Analysis and pointing out the impracticalities of it um, and, uh, you know, how people maybe really think and, and how they should think. Um, and Matthew Sadler, in his book Chess for Life, said that once he tried to mold his thinking process according to, to Kotov's rules, and then he played a tournament right after that, and he said, quote, I didn't play well in that tournament, and truth be told, I didn't enjoy playing one bit either. <laughs> By structuring my thinking, I turned myself into a machine and not a very good one at that. So a lot of the modern authorities, you know, um, now are sort of seriously questioning um, Kotov's whole whole concept. They, none of them really question candidate moves, although often they say, like, you shouldn't enumerate them off the start. Um, but everybody seems to agree that sort of consciously thinking about candidate moves is a good idea. But other than that, it's not really clear that that much survives from the whole tree of analysis, how to calculate variations um, recommendation yeah. of Kotov. Yeah, and... I, basically, all of those uh, authors and books you mentioned, um, I would say maybe reading their books should be a higher priority for for listeners, unless you're just really into Soviet era chess and really into the history aspect. I think that all, all of those are better books for, for chess improvement, in, in my humble opinion. Um, so um, I lost my train of thought. Do you have anything well, to I add, Chris? I, I don't disagree. I love, I love all those books and they're more recent and up to date. A lot of them talk about, a lot of them even talk about, you know, how to use computers in your play and so on, which is a topic that's totally alien to, to Kotov, obviously. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I think there are other books that are better for improvement. Um, but if you want to understand the history of sort of how we got to our current beliefs about improvement, and if you want to understand where this candidate move concept came from that everybody talks about nowadays, even, you know, uh, Jakob Ogard talks about it all the time. Um, uh, one of his whole like types of exercises is called finding the candidate moves. Um, and he's written about Kotov in several of his books. If you want to understand where all that came from, it's, it's a really great place to start. And there's a lot of good material for improvement in it. You know, it's yeah. just like, don't, don't be gullible and think that because this Soviet grandmaster who found queen takes H three check says, you've got to think this way that, that it means that he was thinking that way when he found queen takes H three check or that it's really the right way to think. Yeah. And and speaking of the first chapter, um, you mentioned that you didn't you didn't make much of an effort to do the calculation. The way I approached it is once I started getting into the book and realized like, oh, man, I forgot how labor intensive this book is actually supposed to be in terms of the calculation exercises. I decided I would read the prose first and go back and do some of the calculation later. And yeah, it's it's really hard. I mean, and I find it in its presentation, I find it harder than a lot of sort of the more tactically oriented how to calculate books that you might come across these days. I mean, there's just thickets and thickets of variations. So um, obviously that can be a good way to approach chess. Like when I um, interviewed uh, Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein, he talked about how had he had taken some lessons from, I believe it was uh, Grandmaster Yusupov, who of course worked with Dvoretsky, um, uh, wrote books with him extensively. And um, he talked about the bulldozer method. And then of course, Eugene is a, um, you know, he uh, emigrated from from the former Soviet Union, from the Ukraine to the U.S. Um, in, I believe, his early teens. So he he touched that world. And it, basically what he called the bulldozer method was you just take a position and you calculate everything. You know, you calculate like, you know, six candidate moves, 10 moves deep. You just, um, they basically just drill you. And um, other than the fact that it wasn't as many candidate moves, I mean, there's a lot of that in the the sort of calculation part of this chess book. It's... um. Definitely not for the faint of heart, and I find, I don't know. I mean, maybe it would be better for my chest, but I, I didn't. It, I wasn't inspired to to dig in that that um that deep. It's the kind of thing that sounds like it really should be good for your chest, doesn't it? Like this, yeah. This sounds like really like hitting the gym for like three hours straight or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? But but as as I think Jan Gustafsson said. You know, where's the data on whether any of this stuff really works? You know, right, yeah. if you put data on whether it really works up against sort of Soviet pronouncements, I'll, I'll take the data, I guess, and and or the absence of the data, I think, probably, you know, probably means something. Not to say that calculation exercises aren't good. Everybody seems to agree on that. And there's reason to believe it. But 60 minutes on one position versus, you know, 10 minutes each on six positions. Who, who knows? I mean, I, I, 
I, I think I think I said something like this when I was on the the regular podcast that if it's too aversive to actually make yourself do, it's probably not a good study method because it's not going to do anything for you if you don't do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, it, but but it, it, I think it it feels to me like we're on solid ground in saying that practicing calculating variations in complex positions has, has got to be a good idea because um, so many games are decided by miscalculation. Even if you don't, you don't hang a piece or something like that, the miscalculation of something is probably what decides most games. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, on that note, I think we can move on to a topic that it will be, um, will be a little more, um, a little more praising of this book, um, the favorite quotes. And there are some, some gems in here for sure. Um, and I, again, I kind of, uh, I pick some long quotes just because they give you, especially because we're, we're not saying you should rush out and buy, uh, <laughs> this book necessarily. I mean, certainly if you have it, dust it off the shelves and take a look. Um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with, um, with supporting Batsford Chess, <laughs> especially because Kindle books are, in particular are cheap, although um, we'll get to some formatting issues with it later. But anyway, on to the first quote, um, which is uh, the idea of Botvinnik or Nydorf, which um, this is Kotov's words, uh, where he says, from my earliest top class tournaments, I've examined my colleagues closely and taken an interest in how they behave during a game. Some sit down at the board five minutes before play is due to start and get up only when the game is finished or it's time to adjourn it. Others jump up as soon as they've moved and walk around quickly, quite happy to talk to the other players. Botvinnik has always been example, an example of Olympian restraint and concentration. Only in recent years has he allowed himself a little rest by walking once or twice round the stage during a game. His exact opposite is Nidorf, who cannot sit still. He only walks around the stage when it is not his turn to move, but he also pats his fellow players on the cheek, exchanges a joke with them, and never forgets to ask his favorite question, where do I stand? I myself was always somewhere in the middle, but a little closer to Nidorf. However, I must confess that I was always a little annoyed with myself for this what a fidget always jumping up can disturb your analysis and tends to make decisions superficial on the other hand how can you bring yourself to sit still for five hours what did Botvinnik do to occupy himself when his opponent was thinking and that's the end of the quote so of course Chris um you can reflect on that quote more generally but I also would like to know if you're if you're a Botvinnik or a Nidorf that's I think um I don't know what their relative ages were at the time. They were probably pretty close in age, but, but it can, and Nidorf, maybe Nidorf was younger. Maybe that partly explains it. Um, I think it's changed for me a little bit over time. I, I used to be bad at sitting still during the game and I would often get up and walk around and look at other games and so on. Then somehow I got better at it, maybe just because I felt I wasn't playing as well and I had to keep thinking and I was, you know, I was sort of like, uh, you know, shortchanging the effort that I needed to put in if I, if I didn't, you know, if I got up and walked around, but I have to say in my last tournament, I found myself often getting up and, and walking around and just the walking, I think probably helped. Um, so I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit of, of each. I think we probably all contain a little bit of Botvinnik and, and Nidorf. Um, I'm really glad you picked out this quote because there's several interesting, I think there's several interesting things about this. Um, do you mind if I start with the one about the, the, where do I stand? Um, in a minute. Yeah, we'll get to that. But I did just want to mention, of course, you're in the unique circumstance that your son is playing in the tournament. So um, that's got to make it even harder to, to just focus on your own game. That, that's true. I do. I do get up and look at his game every so often. Um, but uh, I noticed one of my opponents recently was getting up and walking around behind me and looking at the board from behind me. And in fact, maybe standing a little too close sometimes. So I'm, I'm trying to be very careful of, of not disturbing anyone when uh, when I do this. But it's more just to sort of pace around and, and I don't really know why I do it. It just feels like the right thing to do at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and for the record, I, I historically definitely have been a Nidorf, um, much to my detriment. Uh, Mike Shahadi, um, senior yeah. master, and uh, Greg and Jen's dad was um, one of my formative chess teachers. Shout out to Mr. Shahadi. And he always talked about Zitzfleisch, a well-known term in the chess world, basically meaning the ability to just sit on your ass and concentrate. And I had, um, I had a medium to low Zitzfleisch, I would say. Um, definitely was something I, I could be better at. But, but let's get to your quote about where do I stand, Chris, from, well, from this quote. The funny thing is, in, in my copy of the book, which 
I don't know why the translation is different between yours and mine because I think there's one English translation by um, by Cafferty, I think, who translated lots of Russian chess books. In mine, it says, how do I stand? And I interpreted that as meaning he was asking people, what do you think of my position? Am I winning? You know, how am I doing? Uh, which I, at first I thought was kind of shocking because nowadays you can't ask other people to opine on your position and evaluate it for it. You can't go ask Stockfish where you stand, you know, or how you stand. So why should you be able to ask a human being? Um, maybe there's some translation issue and it doesn't imply what I think it implies. But on the other hand, there used to be a much more casual attitude towards talking during games. Um, people, I would do it myself. I would, I would talk about the game. I usually you would try not to get advice. Like you might sit, talk, talk to someone about your game and say, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pawn up. I think I'm better, but I'm not sure whether I can win. And you would not expect them to say, well, if you would just, you know, play King H2 and, and, and Rook G1, then your King would be safe and you can then do blah, blah, blah. It was more sort of like a, I don't know what it was, but it wasn't sort of an advice-seeking function. But the way it's phrased here, it seems like Nydorf is asking people to evaluate his position, which yeah. seems awfully strange. Yeah, I, I kind of take it that way, whether it's where do I stand or how do I stand. And and I have to admit, I have a sort of unique uh, history with this. When I was um, playing my most chess as a teenager uh, in Philly on the eastern seaboard here in the U.S. Um, in the early 90s, um, there were lots of Russian emigres playing chess and they would talk during the games all the time. And in fact, when I went to college and I, uh, needed to fulfill a language requirement, that was why I decided to study Russian because I was just like, I want to know what the hell they're saying during my games. Um, you know, I, I, I need to know this. And I, I've talked to other chess players who, who studied Russian for similar reasons. And, um, you know, having lived in Russia for a few, not a ton of time, a few months, but having studied the culture and stuff, I mean, there, there's just generally a different set of rules about, um, you know, propriety, I would say. I mean, I, I'm certainly, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but I mean, uh, the, the stories of, um, of Soviet collusion and so on and so forth are, um, are well known. Um, and just a general sort of, um, different approach to, to what is right and what is wrong. So, um, yeah, it's, it's strange that he would be so open about it, but I also, um, you know, as you say, there used to be a fine line between like overt cheating versus just generally sort of um, opining on the 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 feel of a position. I guess another thing is that like games used to be even longer back then, right? Like you would play for five hours and you, you know, then you'd adjourn and then you'd play for another five hours and then maybe adjourn again. So maybe there was just like more time for chit chat. The time control was 40 moves in two and a half hours. Maybe there's more time to get up and walk around. But but he attributes this to Nidorf, who's who's not a not a Soviet or Russian player. That's a good right? point. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's maybe there's a little projection going on there or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, so, do you want to hop in with one of your favorite quotes, Chris? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, one thing one one that I noticed is um, uh, he says at one point. Um, in one of the later chapters, I believe, not the first chapter about the analysis of variations, but one of the later chapters, which I guess I should have said are on topics like positional judgment, planning, the end game, and um, a player's knowledge, which is sort of a hodge, you know, like sort of a potpourri chapter at the end. But in one of those later chapters, he says, uh, quote, there is one type of move that has always won my admiration and respect. It happens that a position looks quite level and one cannot see any way of gaining an advantage for either side when suddenly there comes a simple, insignificant looking move. In a trice, one's assessment is changed as the opponent's position is now seen to be indefensible. And he calls the unquote, and he calls those moves creeping moves. And in fact, most of the examples he gives are one square moves by the queen, like queen from C6 to B6 or queen from G4 to H4 or something like that. Um, And I just thought like those were, you know, those are moves that nowadays you might attribute to the style of, you know, Karpov or Carlson um, who seem to make, a bunch of insignificant moves and then suddenly have a winning position. Of course, not all the time, but that's, I think a characteristic of, of their games that is often remarked on. And, and he, um, of course he didn't have them to talk about. Um, he gives an example from, um, a game between Spassky and Korchnoi in the 1968 candidates final match. Um, and what I thought was ironic about it is, and, and maybe the reason why Kotov is so impressed with these moves is that, it's probably very hard to find them using his algorithm. Right. Because the, the reason he even explains that Spassky played queen from C6 to B6, because 
on B6, the queen is protected. So some tactical resource that his, that, that, that Korchnoi had wouldn't work um, in the in the most important line because the queen is guarded on B6, but, but not on, on C6. And the way that Spassky probably figured that out was analyzing the line first without putting the queen on B6 first, realizing that it doesn't work, and then saying, oh, if only my queen were on B6. So he, he generates a new candidate move by analyzing the first candidate move. He generates a new candidate move, which he goes back to, and puts in his list at the beginning and then analyzes, which is all out of sync with, with Kota's formula, but it's exactly what people like Tisdall and, and Nunn and Dvoretsky and, and Ogard and so on, you know, say is exactly what should happen. That's the normal thought process is you have to analyze the position to find all of the good moves. Yeah, that that's a really good insight. And it is a nice, it's it's a nice position, the the spassky Korchnoi game. So I'll link to it and people can can check it out. But that that's a really interesting insight that yeah, it kind of goes against what he um what he advises. Um, so the next uh, quote I will read is having to do with uh, regular listeners might know one of my bugaboos over the board time trouble. Um, so he Me too. yeah, so he is talking about time trouble. It's good to know that even a cognitive scientist deals with uh, time trouble, Chris. So, <laughs> um, so uh, quote number two is time trouble is blunder time. Can you justify these blunders by pointing out how short of time you were? No, you cannot. Nobody will take much notice. No official will change the result in the tournament table. I advise you to develop a sternly critical attitude to time trouble errors. Following the example of Al Yekin, who wrote one of his moves in a game against Tyler, Nottingham, 1936, a horrible move. And in my, in my opinion, the fact that White was in time trouble when he made it is no more justification than the claim of a lawbreaker that he was drunk when he committed the crime. The inability of the experienced master to cope with the clock should be considered as faulty as making an oversight in analysis. Remember that. Um, uh, obviously, he's completely right. And yeah. And whenever, when, whenever I make a mistake in time pressure and I have to explain it to my coach, I say, well, I know this is not, I know this is not an excuse. It's an explanation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was exactly. in time pressure and I know that if I had played faster sooner, I might not have made this mistake. Yeah. And, and I do feel like later in the book, the, the candidate move and tree of analysis chapter is very concrete, but in these quotes, as, as the book goes on, I do feel like you do start to see his personality a little bit more Kotov's. And that is, um, I think that's one of the better things about the book is, um, in my experience, again, I don't have, I haven't read a ton of chess books published before 1971, but m the ones that I have were not as conversational as, as he eventually loosens the reins and becomes, um, at this point, um, in the book. It's so interesting from a psychological point of view that time trouble, even though it's almost as important or maybe more important than a lot of other skills, managing time trouble is, is more important than a lot of other skills in chess. It seems to, to me to be very sort of personality related and maybe age related and, and so on. It's, it's not the kind of thing where you can just like read a book and learn how to like you, like you can learn how to play the Steinitz variation of the French, maybe from books and from playing games and studying games and so on. What do you study to fix time pressure? It really seems like a personality trait almost, or at least something that's, you know, very deeply behaviorally ingrained and all of the exhortations from Kotov and everybody else are good. They should be stated. Um, but I wish someone had a really good sort of behavioral training method to really cure people of time pressure. I would pay money for it. Yeah, it's so it's so hard. Um, this sort of, you know, I, I tried to trade stocks for a while, and a lot of that is a sort of about trying to reprogram your brain, and this is getting into your territory, Chris, but the, there was some author I read somewhere who talked about what, what he called the hot-cold empathy gap, where, where uh, you know, in you read something and you want to implement it, but then you reach a certain situation um, at the moment where you're trying to implement the behavioral change, and it's just infinitely harder to actually do it at that moment than to sort of academically understand the need to do it. Exactly. Um, <laughs> if, what, only, if, only, if only it were so simple. I mean, people like Jonathan Rousen, by the way, in his books talk about this, that, you know, you, you can, you know, some people approach chess um, ability as though it's a matter of knowledge but it's actually a matter of skill. Yeah. And have a lot of knowledge and not be able to implement it over the board. And that does not mean you're good at chess. It might mean you sort of know a lot of abstract stuff, but if you can't put it together and use it to make good moves, then you're not good at chess. Yeah. And uh, speaking of resources, a uh, friend of the podcast, I am Kostya Kavuski, did come out with a YouTube video a few days ago with some some tips about managing time trouble. So obviously I had to watch that given my, uh, even though I'm not playing <laughs> actively at the moment, I've, 
intend to at some point. And when I do, I really need to to work on time trouble. So I check that out. And I definitely recommend it for anyone who's uh, struggling with time trouble. So uh, I'll link to that as well. Maybe we should send it to Grishuk before the candidate. <laughs> I would love to see Grishuk. I mean, I, li- I like uh, I I like a lot of those guys, but Grishuk has a special place in my heart. So yeah, anything we can do to help him, <laughs> um, I'm for. Uh, so, <laughs> so do you want to read another quote, Chris? Uh, sure. Let's see. Um, I think another. Um, well, another one. I, I alluded to this earlier, um, where he, he says a player who wishes to become a grandmaster must be able to analyze accurately, as that is what decides the majority of games. And so I, there, I've said it twice, and I think it really is. It really is important. It's it's easy to overlook that, um, even though you didn't hang anything or you didn't fall into checkmate or something like that, it was probably one or more miscalculation errors that led you to miss better moves for yourself or better moves for your opponent. Um, so he's just, it's just reinforcing the, you know, for him, the value of what he's trying to teach. Um, one that surprised me more though, was where he, he said, quote, I can think of few cases where the two bishops proved the decisive factor. On the other hand, I can recall quite a lot of cases where two knights showed the greater energy and really trounced the bishops. Um, I, I don't know. I was just really kind of shocked to read that because nowadays there's, I think, pretty solid belief based in part on on uh, computers, um, you know, Stockfish or even, um, you know, Alpha Zero and Leela that the two bishops provide a significant advantage more often than not. And, yeah. you know, Larry Kaufman's peace values, you know, give bonuses for two bishops um, and, and so on. Um, and it was struck that Kotov almost seems to have the opposite view. Yeah, yeah, that, that one probably based on uh, what the heavyweights say these days um, does, doesn't hold up as well. Um, on to uh, my next quote, um, which again, it's a, a little more lighthearted than some of the other stuff in the book. He says, uh, more often than not, one cannot forecast the moves of one's colleagues, even though grandmasters do do not all think in the same way. That is why we love chess. We like the game for its boundless possibilities, for its bold flights of fancy, for the wide scope it offers for the seeking and inventive mind. That is why we call chess an art. Um, so I don't have much to add to that. I just I just liked the quote. Um, and again, you can see his enthusiasm for the game shining through. I think it's great that you can understand a lot of it, but not all of it. So when you're following a game, the if you're a reasonably good player, the, the pleasure that you have in understanding the position and maybe being able to predict some of the moves is great. It just doesn't seem like a random, you know, montage of, of things. But on the other hand, you always get surprised. Um, and that's yeah, he, he I think he captures that pretty well. Yeah. Um, so any more quotes, Chris? I'll throw in one more because I think it relates to the sort of the Sovietism of the book a little bit. And um, so, for example, he's, he says at one point, um, a chess player is the commander and the fate of the whole army depends on his ability, willpower and diligence. That is why the question of good or bad peace positions always plays a decisive role. I, I would read that twice if I if, if I didn't want to waste time because it's it strikes strikes me that the first sentence had nothing to do with the second sentence, even though the second sentence begins, that is why. Um, and this it's sort of like Soviet style rhetoric, you know, the, the such and such plays a decisive role and the, the commander, you know, and the fate of the army and so on. It really almost sounds like some of this, you know, s- some of this book is, um, uh, you know, is, is, is written in that style, but I have to say that was really like the low point. So uh, surprisingly, there was very little that was actually like that. So I don't want people to get the wrong impression that the whole, you know, the whole thing is, is like that. And in fact, it's, it's quite delightful to read. Yeah, uh, it is. But there is a little bit of that Sovietism sort of, I think sort of creeps in, you know, here and there. And then that, that's nice from a historical point of view, just to sort of see, you know, to, some, some traces of the, the culture that, the, that these kind of books come from. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just such a different world. I mean, it's easy to forget when you're, I mean, when you're reading a work of fiction, and they take you to a world, you're, you're there with it, right, a lot, right, the whole way to know that you're, you know, you're in Moscow in 1971. (laughs) Whereas, whereas when you're reading a nonfiction academic treatment of chess, uh, it's easy to lose track of just how different things were and uh, how far away he was from uh, most of the people listening to this and and ourselves. Um, so Chris and I, by the way, listeners, um, I mean, you you see the length in the podcast to begin with by the time it's out, but we're not even trying to keep this to an hour. We got some more stuff to do. And Chris and I discussed the rationalization before we started, which is um, 
we're not giving as full-throated a recommendation for this book, so we should talk about it more just in case you don't read it. So, um, <laughs> But we're making decent time, Chris, so let's get to our favorite games or ga- game or games, I should say. Wh- which ones uh, struck you? Um, of course, we already talked about, um, well, as you mentioned, he, the Kotov, Kotov's most famous game wasn't touched upon that heavily, but anyway, which, which games of yours did, did you enjoy? I mean, which games did you enjoy from the book? He doesn't really present a lot of full games at all. It's almost all fragments. In fact, I, I think there are some that go straight, straight from the beginning to the end, but very, very few compared to the number that are um, fragments or key, even just single positions, you know, that he really goes into in depth when he's talking about how to calculate. And one of those early examples in, in the book is from Nicholas Rossolimo, who um, the Rossolimo variation is named after. And that's from that 1950 Venice tournament, which I guess Kotov knew the game because he was, he was there uh, enjoying playing in Venice. And I thought that was nice that that was a that was a position I'd never seen before, but um, really interesting. And I thought I thought it was really one of the better calculation examples that that he has, because it's the it's a kind of position where um, Rosalimo has done something like sacrifice in exchange for a kingside attack or something like that. And it's the kind of position I think that comes up a lot in everybody's play where you you know, the, the, the king is exposed. And if you don't calculate properly, you might just wind up down the exchange or more without winning the game. So it's a really sort of critical situation. Um, it's Rosalimo versus Nestler um, in uh, 1950. And by the way, I guess maybe now would be a good time to point out that that someone on one of the websites, I think it's chessgames.com, um, has done the service of compiling uh, all of the uh, PGNs of all the games that are in this book. So you can go and download that. I think maybe you need to be a member of the site, but you can download that PGN file and then have all the all the games start to finish at least, or the fragments at least in your, uh, you know, in your database. Yeah, that was really nice that you sent me that. And of course I've ranted about stealing books before, um, that this, that, that would not qualify as stealing books. Um, as long as you're, you're buying the book as well. And it, it was helpful because, um, this, this, even the, the Kindle version is a little bit light on the diagrams, which makes the calculation stuff even harder. I think all he did was compile the games. Like he doesn't, he does, it's not Kotob's analysis right. or anything. Yeah. It's just the PGNs of the raw games themselves. Yeah. Sorry. Should have been clear about that, but it's still helpful because you can, obviously you can have that in front of you um, one by one while sitting there with the book. Yeah. All game, all books should come with that. I realize now, like it's so much easier to, to have that in your database, you know, without having to go and search out all these games. If you want to run through them and PG, of course, if you don't have it in forward chess or something like that, but you just want to have it available in case you need to. Yeah. Um, and as for my favorite book, I went with a more, um, positional quiet win, um, plotter Botvinnik 1947, Botvinnik, um, soon to be world champion, um, and according to Kotov, it's, um, you know, he calls it a relatively equal position after move 20 and Kotov just has control of the D file and he has a bishop against a knight and it's cited as sort of a canonical bishop against a knight end game. Although, um, Bafinik also has a better pawn structure, um, but just a nice, clean, classic win. Um, I think part of, I, I gravitate towards the, I mean, of course I love the fireworks too, but I, I, I find um, if you're not going to spend hours studying a game, I can, I often can appreciate those games more. Um, of course, uh, this is one where um, you could pick apart what he says about it a little bit. I mean, uh, the the engines would actually say that from the point that that Bafinik, uh that he highlights, as you mentioned, it's a game fragment fragment starting around move twenty, and the engine would already say that. Uh, that Bafinik was like, uh, it was like minus 1.4 or something. Black was doing quite well, even in the starting position. But still, it's a pleasure to play through the way that Bafinik sort of just uh, systematically converts his advantage. Um, and yeah, I'll link I'll link to that one as well, if anyone wants to, to check it out uh, now, online. Nowadays, isn't that often really because, you know, when the engine searches deep enough, it actually sees the positional maneuvers that... Yeah you know, that are going to lead to a plus one, you know, a 1.4 advantage later on, even if materials, even now it, it, you know, engines are so good that they can, um, you know, in searching ahead, they, they sort of see that the positional advantages will eventually, you know, will eventually snowball. So I'm sort of not that surprised that a modern engine can see, you know, an eventual realization of an advantage from a position that sort of superficially looks relatively equal. Um, that's what they're supposed to be doing. I think. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, <laughs> 
Um, any other games, Chris, or should we uh, move on to improvement takeaways? Uh, I don't have any other specific games. I mean, a couple of points to make are there are a lot of games from Zurich 1953. Um, and so if you've studied Zurich 1953 already, you'll see some things you've already seen. But I think that's okay because a lot of those games, I think, are, are rightly famous. And he doesn't just include the famous ones. I think there's some relatively lesser known ones that he includes. It does seem that Bronstein's book on Zurich 1953 had a, an influence on, on Kotov. Um, and there's also some interesting lesser known examples from older Soviet players like Romanovsky and, and even Taimanov and maybe not that old, but there's some really nice uh, examples from some of those players who, you know, not world championship level or, or whatever. And that's the kind of thing you wouldn't see as much nowadays in a, in a modern book. Most examples in modern books are from very recently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in some ways, the older games are a little bit easier to an- understand as a lot of people have said, you know, that uh, players, uh, you know, um, well, people just weren't as good, you know, 100 years ago at chess as they are now, frankly. So their games are a little bit more instructive in, in, in some ways. Yeah. And especially if you get if you get a decent sized gap between the players, I mean, you can really have some classically instructive games. Um, excuse me. OK. Uh, improvement takeaways. I mean, they're definitely there's no shortage of uh, of improvement takeaways, despite our, um, you know, mild uh, critiques of the book. Um Number one, um, this one is sort of a cliche, but I would just say um, no pain, no gain. I mean, especially when it comes to the calculation uh, portion of the book. I mean, it's really just uh, what you put into it is what you will get out of it. And even if you don't choose this as your calculation book of choice, I mean, there's just no substitute for uh, grunt work. Yeah, I agree. He does give about 20 or 25 exercises um, sprinkled throughout the book, which is kind of the way older books were um, modern modern books especially let's say Jacob Ogard books or many many books have you know hundreds of exercises in them all engine checked and everything like that so this is not the book to use if you want sort of calculation homework to work on but Kotov certainly makes the same point that Ogard and other you know trainers many trainers make nowadays that the work practicing calculation will will pay off Okay. And um, my number two uh, improvement takeaway was he has a really nice chapter on end games at the end, uh, which I believe is where the Botvinnik, uh, aforementioned Botvinnik game came from. Um, but he he talks about the importance of uh, thinking in, in schemes. Um, and he says, let it, and uh, he also um, he mentions points specific to the end game phase. Number one, think in terms of schemes. Number two, do not be in a hurry. Number three, three, bring the qu- king as quickly as possible to the center of the board. Um, so, and he mentioned a few players that he noticed uh, were adept at these things in particular. Uh, Belenevitz, Floor, and Smyslov thought in schemes in end games. And that's, um, you know, for, for higher level players, that's um, probably fairly obvious observation but i think for a lot of club level players it's so easy to get sort of bogged down in um in just i go here they go there i go here they go there but when you when you watch stronger players talk about end games in particular they they have a really um impressive ability to just say like you know first you want to lock this pawn structure then you want to bring your king over here then you want to do this and um he he has a couple good examples of that um so but just the general advice of approaching end games that way in terms of like a multi-step plan can i bring can i break the format and read a quote from that chapter yeah if you're ready um i happen to have the book open in front of me and that chapter by the way is only nine pages long it's the shortest chapter in this 170 page book but it's really good um, I agree with you. Like he makes like really important points. I love when people write short chapters about the end game because you, you get to find like the three or four things that they think are most important. And it's surprising that not everybody says the same things. So not everybody says, do not hurry. Not everyone talks about schemes. And, and he gives a great example of what he means by thinking about schemes also contains some of that old Soviet culture. So here's the quote. He says, once in a lobby of the hall of columns of the trade union center in Moscow, there's old Soviet for you. Yeah, so yeah, that's evocative. That one sounds like a novel. <laughs> um, I think they played world championship matches there or something like that. I was here at the Hall of Columns, you know, and, and so on. Anyhow, once in the Hall of Columns uh, in Moscow, a group of masters were analyzing an ending. 
They could not find the right way to go about things, and there was a lot of arguing about it. Suddenly, Capablanca came into the room. He was always fond of walking about when it was his opponent's turn to move. He was a night orf. Yeah, another callback. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Learning the reason for the dispute, the Cuban bent down to look at the position, said, see, si, see, si, and suddenly redistributed the pieces all over the board to show what the correct formation was for the side that was trying to win. I haven't exaggerated at all. Don Jose literally pushed the pieces around the board without making moves. He just put them in fresh positions where he thought they were needed. Suddenly, everything became clear to us. The correct scheme of things had been set up, and now the win was not difficult. We were delighted by Capablanca's mastery and soon had further evidence of the need to think schematically about the ending. So it's kind of an interesting exercise. Just like imagine you could put the pieces anywhere. Yeah. Would you put them? Like, I, I, I've i never really, I, well, I shouldn't say never, but, you know, I, I think I feel like I've sometimes thought about that in positions like block positions or extremely strategic positions like opposite colored bishops end game endings where you can sort of maneuver at will, you know, and, and so on. But um, it's a great, that's a great little anecdote that really illustrates the point. Yeah. Thank you for, for, um, for hopping in with that. Yeah. And uh, the, it underscores the don't be in a hurry point. I mean, they kind of go together. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if if you're gonna if you're gonna be thinking in schemes, then you need not to hurry. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and one more from me, uh, improvement takeaway, and then we'll get to Chris's. Um, he talks about the importance of correct piece positioning. He says, so in conclusion, I should like to emphasize the importance of correct piece positioning. Remember that in seeking the solution of concrete tasks by analyzing variations, you should never allow yourself to be carried away and lose sight of the need for a harmonious link between all your pieces. Take it as a rule once or twice to look at the position from a different point of view during the game. Ask yourself, are my pieces all cooperating or is there some disharmony in their ranks? A quick check like this can be of great help. Um, so yeah, again, and this is something someone like Jonathan, Jonathan Rosen talking about talk to your pieces like this has been talked about a lot more in sub in modern literature, but but um, at the time I don't think it was um, as as common, and it's just good advice. Yeah, I think people talked about harmony, you know, before Kotov. Like I feel like that's even something Capablanca might have might have written about or something, but he definitely points it out and i think nowadays the term that a lot of people use is coordination you know they'll say they'll literally say something like you know black black is worse because he has bad coordination or something yeah. like that i think that's like the shorthand you see in like you know when geary annotates a game and new in chess or something like that you know he'll write something like that or spiddler will say it in his videos and it's it's a little bit of an opaque concept but i think if you sort of see enough examples you can start to see what it means but developing a feel for it that's that's maybe a little bit harder but obviously important Okay, Chris, do you want to uh, uh, share a few of your improvement takeaways from this book? Yes, I think there are many. And the first one I would highlight is to think consciously about candidate moves, even if you can't follow Kotov's algorithm. And in fact, you shouldn't follow his algorithm. But the one thing you should take from it, if nothing else, is think about a few ideas before you analyze, before starting to analyze the first one. Of course, don't be afraid to add more later when you discover other things. But I, I think I'm I'm pretty bad at this. I, you know, I myself often don't think about all the possible moves. I just start analyzing the first one that comes to mind or the one that I was thinking about before, um, you know, before my opponent moved or something. And that's, that's a bad habit. Um, candidate moves, you know, can't, can't say enough about reminding people of the importance of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you're only going to take one thing from this book, that's say that should be that. Yeah. And then the, the, the ones that were more surprising to me and that I really had never thought about, um, well, the main one was, was um, here's a quote. He says, if I analyze variations only when my clock is going and think of the general considerations while my opponent's clock is ticking away, this would be a great saving in time. This is what he sort of concludes after that whole botvinnik or Neidorf discussion. He says, what was Botvinnik doing during all that time he was just sitting? Yeah, right. Um, what was he doing, you know, if it wasn't his move? And, and uh, Kotop comes up with the idea that you should use some of that time to ask more general questions about the position, like what is my opponent's plan? What should my plan be? Nowadays, um, Jakob Ogard and, and people like Eric Kislik also have sort of suggested questions for what you should think about, like who benefits if we trade queens? Um, you know, what's my worst place piece and how could I improve it? Sort of more general conceptual thinking that doesn't involve calculation of variations. And that that's a great idea because it's hard to know when it's your move. Like you feel like you're wasting time if you're not calculating, but it's a great behavioral cue if you can implement it to say, well, once it's my opponent's move, let me spend a little bit of time on those other 
on those other things. And those things also might be easier to think about when you're not standing at the board either. So maybe you could combine walking around with, you know, thinking about some of those other things that don't require perfect visualization of the board. Yeah. Um, okay. I have nothing to add on to the next one, Chris. <laughs> um, well, he likes to, he, he emphasizes that plans can be like very small ideas, which I think is important because there's sort of a misconception about planning sometimes that planning is sort of like this grand scheme that operates for the entire game. Like, like a minority attack in the queen's gambit exchange variation or something like that you know it's sort of like the plan you know starts on move nine and doesn't end until move 70 when you win the rook end game or something he says a plan is quote just a definite strategic idea a short plan to achieve a concrete objective um and you can have a long series of those um and he, he, he again he quotes bronstein from zurich 1953 he says there's one feature of modern chess which the reader will notice again and again in the games of this tournament, the readiness of the players to react quickly to a change of plan by the opponent by changing their own plan. End of Bronstein quote. And I think that's something really strong players are good at and and you know, not getting stuck in sort of one kind of thinking or one plan or one idea and they're very flexible about that. So I think that's a good, um, a good point. Yeah, and modern players better than ever at that. Yeah, and, and I think that's one reason why Zurich 1953 is sort of regarded as such an important book is because I think it's one of the, it was like the first book that really highlighted, you know, how chess thinking was changing at the time, maybe. Maybe not accurately all the time, but certainly drew attention to that. Um, and then I want to give one non-takeaway, if I could. Sure. Because <laughs> Kotov says, oh, yeah, yeah. as other people say, he says, um, uh, he calls it Blumenfeld's rule because uh, a, a Russian writer named Blumenfeld um, had, had, I guess, suggested it. Or that's where Kotov came across it. But he says, um, you should write down your move before you make it on the board during a tournament game so as to cue yourself to do a blunder check. You know, writing down the move is your cue to now, like, just make sure you're not blundering and then actually play the move on the board. But alas, that is illegal nowadays. Um, so I... I think it's a bad habit for anyone to get into because you're just going to have to change it later on. I know, I know some kids are taught to do that and some people think it's not a big deal, but I'm a little bit of a stickler about the idea that you shouldn't be assisting yourself with anything besides your own brain um, during the game. So writing down your next move on a score sheet is a memory aid and, and it's, you know, and so on. So I'm kind of in favor of not getting in, not getting in bad habits. Huh? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I mean, I, I, I always wrote down my moves before, I move, so I've got the opposite bias, but I mean, I don't think I can, I can't defend it objectively, but, but I mean, it does, it's just another thing that makes chess harder (laughs) if, uh, if you're not writing down your, if you're not allowed to write down your move before you make it. Well, all these rules are kind of arbitrary, right? I mean, I mean, so, so some of them have a more principled basis than others. Like not asking other people what moves you should make during the game is surely a more important rule than right. writing down your own move before you make it. But but there is, you know, there is some logic to it. It is against FIDE rules, so might as well, you know, not and you know, not get started on it. Yeah, I mean, we definitely there needs to be consensus about these things. I mean, if it's a rule, it's a rule. Um, Okay. Uh, how useful for chess improvement? I mean, we've touched on this a fair amount. Um, so again, it somewhat depends on your level. I would say the lower your level, the less useful it is. Um, over over 1900, 2000, I would give it like an, an eight or something. Um, what do you, but below that, it, it descends pretty rapidly because it's, I mean, again, there's some cool little nuggets like the ones we've just shared, but you'll be doing a lot of reading in between those nuggets um, if you're like a 1400 trying to study this book. What do you, what do you think, Chris? I would say when it came out, I would give it a 10. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Nowadays, I would give it a five. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and but but if you're like a skeptical reader and you know you want to think about the advice and like compare it to other books and so on, I, I think you will get quite a bit out of it. I found a bunch of ideas I never thought of. I actually thought I'm going to in my next tournament. I'm going to try to do that thing where I you know when it's my opponent's move and it looks like he's thinking for a little bit. I'm going to try to think about what to you know these general considerations more because I always have trouble like weaving those things into my thought process so there was like even even if I only got that out of it it's it, it, it's worth it yeah I mean and, and again on Kindle it's not expensive so certainly um, you can get your bang for your buck with this book although it's more a question of opportunity cost since uh chess study time can feel so precious um, okay quibbles with the book uh, for me I I mentioned I had the Kindle version um, I wish there were more diagrams. Sometimes when these things get quote unquote translated to Kindle for some reason, and like when there's a uh, a move like Queen H5 check, it will say KH5 check. Uh, <laughs> j- 
Uh, generally, with a little thought, you can figure out what they mean, but it's just kind of a weird quirk that that you come across. Um, what about you, Chris? What 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 would you change about this book if you could? I I agree. More diagrams. Like I just randomly opened a quality chess book um, right now, and you know, one two page spread has seven diagrams, and the next two page spread has four diagrams. But if you look at if you look at this book, you know, each two page spread maybe has one diagram or maybe two. Yeah. Um, back in the day, they just didn't put in as many diagrams. And of course, that sort of forces you to calculate in your head more, which I guess is part of the point. But it's just a much better reading experience with more diagrams. Yeah, agreed. Um, I guess I would say also, um, I feel like this is, you know, th- this is such a classic of chess literature. Like, you know, how useful is it for chess improvement? I don't know, maybe a five. How useful is it for your a chess book collection? A ten. You know, so it's the kind of book where I really think there should be a modern edition. Um, like someone should go and engine check it. Someone should put in footnotes. Some modern trainer should write, you know, an appreciative forward and, and maybe analyze, you know, what what are the important concepts to retain and not kind of like you said earlier on. But someone really ought to do that. And and maybe they could combine it with those other two books of his with similar titles and make sort of like one big, you know, Kota Bible, like, you know, 21st century edition or something. Put it on forward chess and whatever. That would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. I would I would buy that for sure. Um, okay. So I think we, we, we've hit all the major topics on the outline. Um, uh, what would you say? Do you have anything to to say in closing, Chris? In closing, I think, uh, it's weird because as we talked before, we're not all saying how great this book is and everyone has to go read it. Like some of the other books you've, you've talked about, but I think it's a really important book. And it's really important for anyone who likes to collect chess books or likes to understand about chess literature and even understand about sort of how we got to where we are now in our understanding of chess and, and the Soviet school of chess and so on. It really was one of the first ones to be just about the process of thinking as opposed to being about the truth of chess itself. Um, you know, very few books before and then had mentioned this concept or they were just superficial. And, you know, although Kotov was not realistic, he was definitely not superficial. Uh, and... Um, you know, I think really a lot of the value of this book is that it, it took a very strong position and made claims that other authors could then react to. And that kind of dialogue between authors is, is part of what advances knowledge. A like Capablanca said, you know, you should start by studying the end game. I'm not sure many people believe that nowadays, but it certainly is a position that other people were able to think about and, and respond to. And that kind of contribution, you know, can't be, can't be underestimated. So I, I think the book has tremendous value. Uh, you know, in in history and and in the development of chess uh, understanding and chess thinking. Yeah, well said. I I agree. Um, before before we let you go, Chris, I also just want to read a quote. Um, aforementioned friend of the podcast, Kostya Kovutsky. I I really like his YouTube videos. He's he's doing a good job, and I definitely recommend people check out his his catalog. Um, and he did, he also did a video called the top four most overrated chess books. And one of those books was think like a grandmaster. So when we decided to talk about this book, I felt like I should reach out to Kostya and see if he wanted to give a quote about why, why he thinks it's, it's overrated. And it echoes some of what we've said, but I'll, I'll read Kostya's quote. Um, and you can also, um, check out, Uh, his video when you get a chance. Uh, Kostya says, in my opinion, Think Like a GM is worth reading overall. It has a lot of instructive examples discussing important aspects of both strategic and tactical play. It's a Soviet chess school classic that would likely be useful for the average club player. I included the book as a dishonorable mention in my video because of the controversial tree of analysis method that Think Like a Grandmaster is best known for. This is described in the first part of the book and comes with some strict recommendations for how one should calculate. Although I believe many players would benefit from structuring their calculation process in a bit more systematic way, I think Kotov takes it too far in terms of rigidity and doesn't capture the reality of what it's like for a strong player to capture several variations at a time. I would refer listeners to John Nunn's Secrets of Practical Chess, where he thoroughly explains the defects of Kotov's method with some real-life examples of the importance of staying flexible during your thinking. So while I definitely feel the book is worth reading to expand one's understanding of chess, I would caution readers against trying to imitate the tree of analysis method for their calculation. Uh, end of quote. Yeah. Oh, I, I think that's all. I, I think that's all right. If yeah, I would read um, Tisdall's book also, Improve Your Chess Now, and maybe pump up your rating by 
Axel Smith or other, you know, really good commentaries on calculation. And of course, Jakob Ogard's books as well. Um, and Dvoretsky's, those are all, those are all great. Um, and, uh, yeah, if, if you're the kind of reader who tends to sort of believe whatever the author tells you as the truth, then maybe this book is not for you and maybe no book from the Soviet Union is for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I think Kostya, Kostya hit the nail on the head. Um, so last thing, Chris, before we let you drop off, before I get to the blindfold chess problems. Um, so I'm once again, failing at my attempt to pay people to do this. Um, we, we may need to revisit this policy, but in the meantime, I'm happy to donate to a chess, uh, good cause on your behalf. So Chris, um, uh, where would, where should, um, I direct, uh, this modest, uh, donation? I think charity of your choice is a great way to pay people for, for doing, for doing this, this joyful activity with you. And uh, I, I'm a big fan of, of Michael Regan's tournaments with the Maryland Chess Association, and I understand he raises money for the Washington International, which they have every summer and which I hope to play in someday. So um, I suggest you donate whatever you were going to pay me to, to that tournament instead. Yeah, I will gladly do so. And if anyone heard my interview with Michael Regan, I mean, people like that are the often unsung heroes of the chess world. I mean, just donating so much time just so that people can have a pleasant playing experience. And Michael in particular is making the experience especially pleasant. So uh, we'll, we'll happily support that cause. Yeah, um, he's the only one doing great stuff, but I just happen to know he's got a nice donation button there and that, you know, it's, it's, it's a great event. So, yeah, I mean, it's always hard to choose. There's so many worthy causes in the world and in the chess world. So, um, but yeah, Definitely a good choice, and I'm glad to support it. So, Chris, thank you so much. I mean, thanks for putting all this all this work in and, and sharing so much insight. And I know that you had mentioned before that you'd be willing to do more than one book. So 90 minutes and one month later, can I still hold you to that at some point? Uh, sure, but give me a, give me like a refractory period to recover from this of one. Of course, yeah. Start on the next one. Oh, yeah. we I have plenty of volunteers, and I'm uh, eager. I haven't figured out which one, where I'll go next. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, you, you're uh, such a font of uh, information about chess and about thinking. So uh, hard not to take advantage uh, once once you've recuperated. <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. Looking forward to it. All right, Chris. Thanks a lot. Um, and we will get you back on the regular pod at some point, too, because I know you've got some more stories to tell. Sure. It would be great. All right, guys, it's just Ben now back for the blindfold puzzles of the month. For those who have not listened before, we try to leave you after each chess book recaptured with a blindfold puzzle that you can either take or leave, attempt to solve it. If you are going to attempt to solve it, please be safe. If you're driving, be careful or pull over. If you're on a treadmill, maybe slow it down. We don't want anyone to crash while they're exercising their brain. So puzzle number one, I'm guessing, is about 1400 level. It's an endgame puzzle. It is white's move. It's going to be white to move and win. Here's the piece placement. White has pawns on c5, d5, and f4. And white's king is on b2. Black has pawns on d7, e7, and h7. And black's king is on b5. So to repeat, white has pawns on c5, d5 and f4 and white's king is on b2 black has pawns on d7 e7 and h7 and black's king is on b5 and as usual if you look in the show description i'll have two links the first one will have just the position without the answer and the second link will say solution and there you can go if you're stumped on to puzzle number two, which I think is a little bit harder. It's another one of these mate and two puzzles where white has a bunch of pieces and black doesn't have any other than the king and the king's in the middle of the board. So not the most practical chess puzzle in real life, but I think it can be a good visualization exercise. And this is taken from the step series, as was the one I used in the Life in Games with Mikhail Tal recap puzzle. So white to move and mate in two, guessing 1900 to 2000 level. Here's the pieces. White has pawns on f2 and g4. White has a bishop on f5. White's queen is on h8. And white has a king on d8. Black's king is on g5. That's it for black. So once again, black king on g5. And then white has pawns on f2 and g4. 
a white bishop on f5, a white queen on h8, and the white king is on d8, and it is white to move and checkmate in two. So that's it for this month's edition of Perpetual Chess Chess Books Recaptured. Thanks for listening, everyone, and I will catch you guys soon. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes my producer, Matthew Passy, for his timely and capable editing, Chessable.com for their generous support of the show. But I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess, whether it be by telling a friend, writing a positive review on Spotify or YouTube, or we could use some new reviews on Apple Podcasts. If you're enjoying the show, please write a quick review. It helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess. But most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially. People who donate via PayPal or Patreon really help me continue to sustain and grow Perpetual Chess. And those who donate more than $5 a month get their name or entity's name read on the outro. That's about to happen right now. So I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities for their generous support of Perpetual Chess. They are Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natel, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine DeRay, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster 9000, Moonmaster, we need a question from you. Is everything okay? We need you to send in a listener question. Peter Sadi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, and Todd Kennedy. I would also like to thank the following Rook Level supporters. They include Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Bleskachak, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am elect or possibly not I am elect. I don't know if Three Norms makes him an I am elect. Donnie Ariel. Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letarte Lavoie, Frank Tortoris MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Srinivasan, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Banastia, James Murr, Jason Anfang, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Jerry Wells, J.J. Stranod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyavsky, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passam, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbuck, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Jang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, as always, for listening and interacting with the Perpetual Chess community, and I will catch you guys next week.